So I think there will be yeah, uh, to have their facial sandwiches and maybe go on the floor, maybe make start. So, so um, my name is David McAllister, a professor of clinical epidemiology and medical informatics, and I'm very pleased today to introduce Laurie Thomas. Going to be giving our Laurie's talk lecture. Uh, Laurie is an academic clinician, uh, an NIHR research professor based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and she's a kidney doctor uh, based at Brighton and Sussex University Hospital and NHS Trust. Yeah. Laurie and I first met seven years ago at a Welcome Bite meeting. We stuck together because we were the only clinical epidemiologist there. <laughs> Everyone else was a wet lab scientist or a kind of infectious disease boffin. And the worst thing is, is that we were users of routine data which um, at that time, even more than now, I think was much maligned. <laughs> so um, since then, I've been struck by Laurie's excellent approach to academia, um, characterized by inventiveness, being supportive of junior colleagues and, and colleagues at the same level as her, commitment to high quality and very open research, and a willingness to engage with controversial topics not for the sake of controversy, but because it does matter to patients and following where that leads, uh, regardless of where it takes her. So in our talk today, um, called um, Observational Data to Independent Epidemic Guidelines, How Far Can We Go? Laurie's going to address one of the biggest challenges um, that many in the room are going to be familiar with of using observational data. How far can we trust it when it really matters to people's health? So, uh, for our first Maurice block meeting in our new building, Thanks very much, David. Um, yeah, it truly is an honour to be here. I've never done a lecture like this before, so bear with me if I mess it up halfway through. Um, so, yes, so as David said, this is quite a controversial topic. So we're all incredibly familiar with this idea of a, a hierarchy of evidence with randomised clinical trials or systematic reviews, multiple trials at the top. And of course, that's absolutely correct. RCTs do give us the most robust causal inference data, and they give us a very strong data about drug adverse effect. And everything I say is coming after that. So I don't want to um, anyone to think that I think that observational data can replace the robustness of clinical trials. And I think epidemiologists, as, as every, all other uh, working in science, are constantly advocating for simpler, more pragmatic clinical trials, a reduction in bureaucracy, um, and that's just an absolute given. But of course, there are situations in which we don't have robust RCT data, and I'll be talking a bit more about what we can do to fill in those gaps in a minute. So in the UK, we are incredibly lucky to have a wealth of observational data, um, huge richness uh, and depth of data. So here is one of our uh, forms of observational data, uh, the clinical practice research data link, and it's um, informed by consultations between primary care doctors and patients. And there's a huge depth of information about the clinical presentation, drug, uh, any drugs that are prescribed, referrals to hospital, blood tests that are requested by the GP, immunization history, and it's a huge um, depth of, of clinical um, data that we can use to perform very high quality observational studies. But of course, there are a lot of problems with this data. You're all familiar with this. There are many sources of bias and confounding in observational data, some of which can be very hard to track down. Um, patients are prescribed drugs usually because they're at risk of something. So statins are prescribed to people at risk of cardiovascular disease, making looking at an association between statins and cardiovascular outcomes a challenging, uh, a challenging study to conduct. There are many sources of data that are poorly recorded. So, for example, detailed smoking data or alcohol uh, history, which can again get in the way of um, analyses and the relationship between the exposure and the outcome that we are trying yeah. to get a lot of clarity on and of course the great example of this is HRT where on the left here we have the um, observational data and down here at the bottom you've got the uh, overall summary risk ratio showing a protective effect of HRT against cardiovascular disease but when we went on to do the randomized trials we thought that HRT was associated with an increase in risk and this 
find the data really set epidemiology back a long way. And there was a huge backlash with um, editorials in the BMJ saying we should, we should just give up. But since then, there have been substantial improvements in observational study design that I think are not necessarily visible to people who aren't working in this field. So just on the left here, some of the sort of things that had tried to improve the methodology, high dimensional propensity scores, use of positive and negative controls, replication in other data sources, better causal methods like directed acyclic graphs, and then what we'll be talking about a bit more, trial replication in a minute, and use of the clone sensor weight method within that to try and get around some of these biases. And the emulated target trial approach, um, which was particularly promoted by Miguel Hernan, and this is the first paper to discuss this approach, has gained a lot of traction um, to try and really make explicit what we're trying to analyze and to try and align that with what an RCT we're trying to emulate would look like. So we can be very clear about where sources of bias are arising. And one of the most um, large scale attempts to kind of look at this is the RCT duplicate initiative led from Harvard by Sebastian Schneeweiss. Unfortunately for me, this paper was finally published yesterday. Um, so this is uh, on, on the right here. See that coming? We have um, a bland Altman plot. What they did was they took uh, 32 trials and they tried hard to replicate that in an observational data. And, and then they uh, assessed how well the observational study was able to replicate the design and the results of the clinical trial. And when they plotted the, uh, the logs of the effect estimates uh, from the clinical trial with the uh, observational data, they found a pretty good correlation, 0.82. Um, but actually, the, the agreement between the trials, when the estimates from the observational study fell within the 95% interval for the trial results, it was less good. So only about two thirds of the observational studies found basically the same, same results as the clinical trial. So lots of work going on to try and unpack this and to try to understand what are the reasons why we can't estimate, um, uh, where, is the, where are the situations where we can't estimate clinical trial results well? Is it to do with the data? Is it to do with un unmeasured confounding and so on? So this is uh, also updated since yesterday. So this is work from my, my PhD student. I might see if I can, can you see the cursor? Yeah. Yeah, so at the top here is, is the on-target clinical trial which was a study comparing ACE inhibitors with angiotensin receptor blockers, so two commonly used drugs, mainly for hypertension, but also for things such as kidney disease. Uh, so comparing those two drugs for cardiovascular disease prevention and finding a, a very much a null result. So it was a large, well-conducted RCT. The observational studies, you can see here, two large observational studies failed to replicate that finding and showed a protective effect of angiotensin receptor blockers. And that's almost certainly due to unmeasured confounding that angiotensin receptor blockers are, or certainly historically, have been given to lower risk patients. And subsequently, there have been three attempts to um, replicate this using a clinical trials approach. And uh, in the RCT duplicate initiative, they weren't able to do this. And they used um, insurance claims data, whereas my PhD student has replicated it incredibly well using UK data um, with an emulated target trial approach. So still a lot to, to learn and unpack about what's the best way to, to do these types of approaches. But regardless of how far we've come and potential problems, there's still a huge uh, interest and the focus on this and is being used for regulatory decision making. So this is just a timeline of some of the things that have happened over the last few years. So it's really being led by the FDA in America with their real world evidence programme. And then a number of um, uh, milestones with the NHRA in the UK, European Medicines Agency, and also NICE publishing their real world evidence framework uh, in June last year. And this is uh, a very, very thorough, complete document discussing lots of the sources of bias and confounding observational data and how we can um, get, get closer to a, a true estimate focusing very largely on the emulated target trial approach and laying things out for the pharmaceutical industry and, and academics as well who want to bring evidence to NICE um, so that it can be the most robust evidence being used. 
And the, at the beginning, David mentioned my uh, NIHR research professorship, and I'm working with NICE to try and use observational evidence to, to see how that uh, works in their decision making process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So, this is where <coughs> I'm at. Undoubtedly, RCTs are the best. But can we use well conducted studies of any design um, to try and support clinical care, um, support clinical guidance, as well as what's already being used in regulatory uh, settings? So, I'm just going to discuss two examples. And um, so, first example is whether we should stop using it. Nergotensin receptor blockers in advanced CKD. So they're very commonly used in early CKD or in, uh, potentially even before they were developed. And then patients progress, and we end up in situations like this. So this is a very typical example of a, a slightly older woman um, with background <laughs> hypertension. On ultrasound, she's got small kidneys, so we know she's got chronic kidney disease. She's got a reasonable amount of protein leaking into her urine, but otherwise she's very healthy and her home blood pressure is very is adequately controlled. And she's taking three drugs to achieve this, a higher the, the maximum dose of ramipril, an ACE inhibitor, as well as a calcium channel blocker and a diuretic. But her kidney function continues to decline. So uh, between 2018 and 2021, it progressively fell. And now she has an EGFR of 26, so roughly 26% of kidney function. She's now falling into CKD stage four. And there's an uncertainty about what to do with her treatment. Her potassium is still safe. So there's actually remarkably little evidence to inform what clinical decision we should be making. So there was uh, this, this trial reported in NHEM uh, many years ago, uh, 2006, uh, looking at benazapril, an ACE inhibitor in advanced chronic kidney disease, but only 422 patients. So not the kind of level of RCT evidence that we, we really expect to um, inform robust decisions. And there were some post hoc analyses of other clinical trials, focusing on patients who had more advanced kidney disease at baseline, also showing similar results. But there was also an observational study came out in 2010, um, focusing on observation data. No, it's only our cut. My screen is very bad. Can you see it? Yes, it's very bad. Can you see it? Yes, it's very bad. Can you see it? Yes, it's very bad. So, yeah, so a, a small number of patients where ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers were uh, stopped in patients whose kidney function was declining, and then the subsequent uh, effect on their kidney function was monitored. And among those patients who stopped, there was a substantial improvement in kidney function, delaying the time to start uh, dialysis treatment. Uh, and so this had a big impact on the kidney community. Patients were really, doctors were really worried. And there was huge uncertainty about what we should be doing. And this led to the setup of the STOP ACE trial. So it's a big national trial, NIHR funded, patients with progressive stage four by CKD. And they had, um, they had to show evidence of progressive deterioration of kidney function, like the, the case of the lady I showed you, um, in order to enter into this trial. So it was quite robust to, to get in. And then they were randomized to either stop or continue the drugs. And obviously it was open label, they knew whether they were continuing or not. And just to kind of give you an idea of the timeline, the paper I just showed you, the observational paper was published in 2010. This study started recruitment, having battled through to get the funding, get study set up 2014, and then completed recruitment in 2018. So in the meantime, um, I worked with these amazing colleagues, Juan Jesus Carrera at the Karolinska and Edward Fu, uh, his PhD student at the time, um, also at Karolinska, to look at this study about stopping a renin-angiotensin inhibitors, a very closely allied question, but using routine data. So this was the research question that, that Edward set out to address. What's the risk of uh, kidney replacement therapy as a primary endpoint among patients who stop or continue RAS inhibitors when they develop this low level of kidney function. And they also looked at risk of mortality and the risk of major adverse cardiac events. 
And they set this up very specifically as an emulated target trial. So on the left here, you have all the kind of features that you're looking at in a clinical trial. Who's your population? What's the strategy? What's the treatment assignment and so on? And they replicated this, this as closely as they could in the observational data. And this was the study design that they, um, they developed. So here they took patients from the Swedish renal registry, which is a pretty uh, robust source of, of data, identified patients who were taking ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers between 2007 and 2017. And they identified patients whose GFR kidney function fell to less than 30. And then those within a six month period after that, who either stopped the drugs within the six months of, of the GFR falling or continued. Um, and the, the outcomes they went on to look at was, as I mentioned, kidney replacement therapy, which they could capture very well from the Swedish renal registry, yes, and cardiac event. And they followed the study up for five years, or from June 2017, whichever came sooner. So those of you who um, know a lot of epidemiology will have immediately seen a lot of difficulties with the study. Now, the traditional way of doing this would have been simply to identify patients who were, weren't taking insignificant drugs of interest six months after the GFR fell. This is such a dramatic. In the clinical trial, you have this, um, as well as the robustness of randomization, you also know which patient started which drug or stopped which drug on any particular day. And you can absolutely align your start of follow up with the day that their treatment changed. Much harder to do that in observational data. So, all we have is the prescriptions. And so, we can tell when a patient was given a prescription. We can identify some period after that when they're no longer receiving prescriptions. Within that, there's a huge uncertainty on the time that they actually stopped taking it, even if they were actually taking the drug, which we don't, also don't know. And um, so that's one major source of problem is uncertainty about the, the change in treatment status. Also, any patients who died within this time will uh, not be captured. They won't, they won't be enrolled in the study. And so only the patients who are still alive and taking a drug at this stage or not taking a drug will be captured. And this creates a, quite a significant amount of bias. So Edouard used a, a technique called cloning, censoring and waiting to try and address this. Uh, and so in this approach, what they do is they create a, a pseudo population, an artificial population, with the characteristics of the original population, and then they clone it and, and say that half the people are going to continue treatment and half the people are going to stop. Um, and obviously, both of these groups of people are identical at baseline because they're simply clones. And then every month, they look in the data to see whether there's evidence of ongoing prescriptions or not. And when it's clear that somebody's either stopped or continuing to take the drug, then the sensor in the arm that they're not, no longer following is deleted. So at the beginning, you know that the two groups are identical and there's no confounding. So then um, uh, the, the patients are censored. Um, but the trouble is that the censoring is informed by things. In real life, patients don't just stop the drug for no reason or continue it. So a clinician, even though there's uh, uncertainty about what to do, we don't know what the right treatment approach is, some patients will be more likely to remain on treatment than others. So one strong indication for continuing treatment, heart failure. So if a patient has heart failure, they're much less yeah. likely to be sensitive because they're going to remain on the drug. And that means you're developing over time differences in the population. One group that has stronger indications for continuing than the other. And so that tries to be addressed through waste, through waiting. And so what that does is takes account of the different characteristics of the different populations and uh, assigns a weight to them um, for continuing or not continuing to try and adjust for these differences in the population characteristics. And in this study, Edouard used many clinical factors over 40 to try and adju adjust these differences in um, who is carrying on with treatment or not. He also used other approaches. He looked at stopping at higher or lower kidney function, other factors that might have influenced the decision to continue taking treatments like diabetes and heart failure, 
and also things that may have influenced the decision to stop. So if someone's got high potassium, they might have been more likely to smoke. Mm -hmm. They use a, a different um, statistical approaches, a standard marginal structural model. And then they also use this negative control analysis. And this is the idea where your um, outcome is something that should be completely unrelated to the decision to stop or continue treatment. So uh, in this situation, they looked at the outcome of cancer, not within the first couple of years, because that might have been, uh, a, a kind of, um, that might, that might have influenced the decision to stop because of uh, palliative care, for example, but longer term cancer, and they saw no difference in the rates of cancer between the patients who stopped or continued, suggesting that there weren't major differences in characteristics uh, after they tried very hard to adjust for these. Roll on to now, and the original Stop Ace trial is now published, came out at the end of last year. So now we're in the situation where we've got the observational study, which was initiated, conducted, and published all well within the time frame of the Ace study, which took much longer. Um, but obviously the, the clinical trial is randomized uh, and has lots of other benefits. So how do the population characteristics compare? So on the left here, you have the STOP ACE trial. So you can see that they enrolled 411 patients um, and they had, the average age was 63 um, and they had a relatively low level of comorbidities such as MI, heart failure, uh, and stroke. On the right, you've got the observational study, over 10,000 patients in that. And it's an older population with a much higher prevalence of comorbidities like diabetes and heart failure. And so, and you can tell you what it's like in Scotland, but this seems much more representative of the patients I see in clinic who tend to be older and more comorbid compared to the stop based population. So I'm just going to very briefly run over the comparison of the results. So on the left here, we have the primary outcome, well, co-primary outcome of the stop ACE study, which was about initiation of dialysis. And tantalizingly, they showed this hazard ratio of 1.28 with confidence intervals of 0.99. So they've interpreted that as no difference. And um, if you're less of an absolutist about p-values, you might say that, that was weak evidence uh, of, of an increase in the in initiation of dialysis among the people who stopped their treatment. In the observational study, they showed no difference at all. The risk, the risk ratio was 0.96. So um, and just to, just to flag as well, the, the differences in the absolute rates of the outcome. So here you can see that the, in the clinical trial, the absolute rate of the outcome is nearly 70%. So a large proportion of these patients are reaching dialysis. And I mentioned earlier that that's because there was this very robust way to ensure that only patients finally keep the functional loss into the clinical trial, which they didn't have in the observational study. And here only about 20% of people at three years have gone on to dialysis. The different populations being studied. So just to summarize what I just said, there's no or weak evidence, depending on, on your interpretation, of an increase in the difference in, the, in dialysis in the randomized trial, but there's this high event rate. In the observational study, there was no difference in dialysis initiation at three years. And just to more briefly summarize the other results, um, mortality, um, there was no difference seen in the randomized trial, but very low outcomes, low power. Whereas in the uh, observational study, they did see an increase in mortality among the patients who stopped the drug. And here, consistent with this older comorbid population, much higher event rate. And then in terms of cardiac events, this wasn't reported in the RCT as, a, as an outcome, it was reported as an adverse event. And they said there was no difference for this, but in fact, there was a tantalizing uh, possibly statistically significant difference of 108 events in those who stopped treatment compared to 88 who didn't. Um, you can see in the, in the uh, observational data, there was a clear difference. In patients who stopped their treatment, there was a higher rate of cardiovascular events. So just to conclude this section, you've got two studies addressing similar questions, one uh, suffering or benefiting from the huge uh, benefits of randomization, careful endpoint adjudication, and all the other things that go along with being in a clinical trial, but low power, and it obviously took a long time to conduct the study. And you've also got an observational study, probably a more representative population. It's very well powered, but of course, there may be sources of unknown bias. 
uh, in that. Um, and the trial in, in the paper, they interpreted this as no evidence of harm, and therefore people should continue taking the treatment because we know from other randomized trials that there are substantial benefits with continuing on the drug. The observational data can extend that to a much larger population beyond this very select clinical trial population. It's got consistent findings and also evidence of harm compensation. So to me, these two studies taken together give us the confidence to continue to recommend treatment in patients with these advanced kidney problems, unless there's a very compelling reason to stop. And I don't think that I would feel confident to say that if I had either of those studies alone, but taken together, I feel much more confident. So that's kind of the first example of where a uh, observational data can hopefully complement a randomized trial and uh, fill in some of the gaps. So the second example I'm going to give is work we've done more recently about the use of citrubimab for vulnerable patients with COVID-19. And in order to do that, I'm just going to very briefly talk about Open Safely. Uh, so Open Safely was a uh, data analysis platform that we set up at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. It's a collaboration between NSH Chairman University of Oxford. And um, it was a fantastic resource that enabled us to do a lot of very detailed research. So what it contains is a near live, um, uh, near live data taken directly from GP records that are in the TPP or System 1 um, GP database, which is about 40% of England. That pseudonymized data is then taken to a server where it's linked by the TPP team to many other sources of electronic health record data. So we had COVID-2 testing results, hospitalization and mortality data from the ONS, vaccination records, and also other sources of data. And the useful thing about OpenSafely, or the way in which it differs from other platforms, is that it's extremely secure. So you interact with data only via analytical code. You can never see the individual patient records, and it absolutely removes all concerns about, um, uh, about patients being re-identified from their data. And lots of work shows it's been very well trusted by patients, and they're happy to have their data shared in such a way. So uh, towards the end of 2021, um, a number of drugs were introduced for outpatient treatment of COVID, and both monoclonal antibodies and antiviral treatments. And these began to be rolled out by the community medicine delivery units in England. I think it was similar similar process in Scotland, although not via CMDUs. Um, they were being rolled out to high, high, uh, patients who were identified at very high risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19. Um, and we were very lucky to have all this, this data linked into open safety very rapidly. So we could look immediately at the way these drugs were being used. We could look at uh, uptake, as, as you see here. Um, and also we looked at uh, disparities in ethnic and social uh, disparities in care, trying to see if we could optimize delivery of the treatments. The problem with COVID is that it's rapidly mutating. And so many of you will be familiar with this type of pattern of rapidly changing prevalent variants of uh, COVID-19 um, over, over this, this period. And this makes it very problematic for design and delivery of new therapeutics, because most of the uh, therapeutics for COVID-19, when they were in their randomized trials, were against uh, the original wild type of virus, or possibly Delta, Delta variant. And they were... Um, mainly in unvaccinated populations. So by the time the drugs were being rolled out, they were in, in predominantly vaccinated people with a different, against a different type of virus. So there's a lot of uncertainty about whether these drugs are actually working. And of course, it was hard to turn around an RCT, even though we've done so brilliantly during COVID in, in speeding up those processes, it's still hard to do an RCT in that period of time. And also, there's a lot of varying basic science evidence. So I've got no idea really what this means. Hopefully it will be relevant to some people in the room. But there were a number of basic science um, experiments showing that the, um, the different monoclonal antibodies were less effective against COVID-19 compared to the original wild type uh, of virus. Although um, the different, different science experiments were quite variable in their results. So depending on um, the, the type of assay, the type of virus, 
um, the yeah, specific setup details of the assay, people were getting quite different results. So there was huge uncertainty, but it was very impactful. So uh, the FDA in America withdrew Citrivimab quite early on, and so it was never really used in America. It continued to be used in Europe. So towards the end of last year, this became a critical question. We were moving from a pandemic situation where drugs were being administered um, kind of outside of the normal processes, trying to move back towards standards design where in England, NICE will review, um, will review all of the evidence and make a, an assessment of whether it's the right thing to do to fund that treatment, does it work? And you know, what's the health economics around the, the cost of its delivery? So what drugs should NICE recommend for routine use for outpatient treatment for COVID? So the initial decision in November 22 was to not recommend citrivimab. Um, there was no clinical trial evidence against current variants. There was a discrepant um, basic science data. And the FDA and also the World Health Organization had all come out and said that citrivimab should not be used. Trouble is that what was left is Paxlovid, so it's Appears to be a very good and effective drug, but it's contraindicated. Um, initially, it was uh, re recommended not to be used in patients with advanced kidney disease, although that has changed somewhat. But it is specifically contraindicated in patients who are taking certain drugs that are used for the to prevent rejection from kidney transplants. So there's a really important group who knew they were at the highest risk of severe outcomes from COVID 19. Patients were still terrified, they were still shielding. They felt their lives were on hold, and now they were being told that there was no treatment that they could be given if they got COVID. And lots of anguished stories of, of what patients were experiencing. So we went on to do this study, um, and we chose to compare citrivimab with molnupiravir um, to look at the effect on severe COVID-19 outcomes uh, within open safety. And the reason we chose this method is that to compare the effects of two drugs that are being given for similar reasons undoes a lot of the sources of bias that might be uh, might be implied in a let's say a, a tra treatment with a drug compared to no treatment and there's also huge sources of confounding we don't know how unwell these patients are with COVID-19 so um, it seemed like a much more robust method now regrettably we didn't set this up specifically as an emulated target trial partly because we were trying to do it really quickly um, and we just I weren't thinking thinking that way but effectively we did align it with clinical trials we certainly um, used our outcomes the same as in the clinical trials our follow-up periods were taken so all of these things were in, intuitively done um, so we used all of the adult patients in system one we identified the adults who developed COVID-19 in the community and weren't in hospital at the time there was a five-day period in which these drugs could be given. So we compared the outcomes between those given to Trumab and those given Molnupiravir. And we looked in two study periods, which unfortunately is under the transcription, but these were the early trial period. And then true therapeutic equipoise and guidance said, you can give either of these drugs, we don't think either is better. So it was a very, that's a very good situation to compare drug effective. And it aligned with the BA1 variant of COVID. And then we looked in the later period, which aligned with the BA2 variant. Um, so we tried to do this as robustly as we could. We used stratified Cox model, stratified on different parts of the UK. Prevalence may vary uh, around different parts of the country at the time. Um, and then we also used a propensity score weighted model. Neither of them made any difference. We consecutively adjusted for um, different factors so that we could see if there was a substantial change in effect estimate as we progressively adjusted. But bottom line was that we saw that citrivimab was more effective um, regardless of any of those, those factors. And then as we were kind of beginning to write it up, the panoramic trial was published, which showed that um, molnupiravir didn't have any effect on preventing um, admission to hospital among uh, patients treated with the active drug. So again, we this is a different question, but we had that kind of RCT robustness showing that that didn't seem to be that a substantial benefit from, from Pyravir, which was supported. So after that paper was published, we've gone on to use other things. We collaborated with colleagues in the Scottish Renal Registry 
and use the UK renal registry data linked in so safely to look at this effect across um, across two different data sources, um, but specifically among this very high risk population of those advanced kidney disease. And we've also now looked at Paxlovid as well to reflect the most current treatment guidelines. And it was very, it was very pleasing that this data was carefully considered by NICE as part of the technology appraisal. So you've got the initial draft guidance rejecting Struvimab, but in the, in the in coming towards the final decision, they um, chose to use our data um, because they felt that it was strong enough to have some uh, some weight and some some robustness. And it was very strongly advocated for by the patients. We also collaborated with NICE. So in their health economic model, um, they were very keen to have up-to-date ideas of how many people were being uh, admitted to hospital um, to inform their health economic modeling to see how you know, the cost benefits of these drugs or the, the costs of these drugs compared to the claim threshold. So we were able to provide you know, within the previous month, the, the data that they wanted for modeling. And the incredibly uh, surprising and positive outcome of that was that in the final guidance, they just made the decision to reinstate true map. And that was predominantly based on our data. Um, and then subsequently, France and Germany have followed that, uh, that decision. So weirdly, it's now not used in America at all, but still used in um, France and uh, in Europe. And clearly, we might be wrong, it's observational data, um, but NICE have uh, contracted us to continue to look at this data to see if we can measure effectiveness changing, uh, particularly if there's a, a new, very prevalent or severe variant. So, in conclusion of this section, this is a situation where there was significant uncertainty, but, you know, still a very important population health issue, and the Recommendations based purely on the randomized control trial evidence supported by the basic science left that the patients at the highest risk of severe outcomes without any treatment options. So a little bit of funny writing robust, robust evidence there, you might disagree, but hopefully you'll feel that this reasonably good uh, evidence was included in the decision making process, leading to a change in the recommendations. So um, as I mentioned, we have this, this wealth of routinely collected data. We can analyze it quickly. It's low cost compared to clinical trials. Uh, so it has huge benefits. Um, and whatever you think about it, it is being used much more widely for regulatory decision making. And we have come a long way in trying to improve, improve observational methods to try and uh, address the clear problems with it and increase the robustness of the results that we can conclude. But there are, of course, huge challenges. We're not there yet with being able to replicate RCTs and understanding those, those sources of those error is a huge area of ongoing work. But I think we're now in a situation where real world evidence can produce some, provide some evidence and, and support some clinical decision making. And the situations I've talked about are where there are related clinical trials, but there are concerns about how those clinical trials relate to a wider population particularly if there have been excluded subgroups, we can extend our, our trials to look at those subgroups in, in routine care. There are very rare situations when they can provide more robust decision-making um, support. I mentioned the Citruvimab work, which was, I think, was certainly unusual, quite unique, but unusual, in that there was true therapeutic equipoise at the beginning when we were comparing two drug effects minimizing, hopefully, sources of bias and confounding. And it was a public health emergency, and there was a huge equity issue around certain groups of patients. So there were specific things about that that made it much easier to use real-world evidence. But we still have a lot of work to do on understanding how we can optimally use observational data. And I haven't even touched on the system factors, the barriers to change um, in terms of clinicians who are making these policy decisions coming very much from a randomized controlled trial viewpoint and then rightly so you might say but what is needed to um to try and robustly use data in a way that's got support from the, the clinical community and those making decisions 
So that's all I've got to say. I'd like to thank my amazing team, all the funders, and everyone I work with. Hey, uh, thanks very much, Laurie. Uh, do we have any questions in the room? Okay, I'll start off then as is tradition. No, actually, you have to think of a question because other people are something really difficult. <laughs> so, um, you make a really, thank you for made a really interesting distinction between good quality work with observational data and poor quality. So, how do we go about ensuring that more of what's done is high quality? Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't going to, I you going to say, how do you tell the difference? Um, in terms of how do we ensure that it's high quality? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And I think that one of the things that really needs to change is um, teaching about data science and enabling people to, uh, and I think particularly the clinicians, there's, there's a lot of poor quality data out there that is generated because of the pressure to publish people um, seeing uh, big data as a way to get a, get a study out quickly. And I think that um, people coming through the system now who are training in epidemiology and data science, really understanding how to do things robustly is absolutely critical. And I think there's funding for that. Um, there are obviously many ways in which um, we're trying to improve the, the, the quality of the data, you know, a priori uh, protocol publication, um, following um, following reporting guidelines, like um, and that, that is making a difference, but I still think it can be very difficult to tell. And since you volunteered, then what about the other question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, oh, Paddy's now. No, 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 it's, not, it's, not, it's not a very hard question. You might, you might not know the answer. So there, there is a randomized controlled trial of Citrovimab in this group of patients to prevent COVID, um, and I've absolutely no idea, you know, idea what, what happened to it. It's still going. And do you have any insights into it? Because obviously, and, and what do you expect the result will be? And do you, I guess, what, thing is, so I obviously have patients, I'm, I, I'm a kidney doctor, I look after these people, um, who get COVID, gets a trovimab, and then come back four months later and have got COVID again. So clearly it didn't protect them for very long, and at least it stopped them dying, as you've proved, and they would contribute to your data. But, but I just wonder, is it worthwhile them continuing with that randomised control trial based on what you've shown already? Um, so... For those who don't know, there's a, a platform um, trial network among in, in the kidney community in England. Is it in Scotland as well? Yeah, yeah, it is in Scotland. Well, well we're not running it because we thought it was rubbish. It's not really a clinical decision to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, the number of things where have been tried for uh, prevention of COVID among this vulnerable population of patients with advanced kidney disease. Um, and one of the things the interventions has been used is Trufamab as a preventative um, medication. So uh, you'll, many of you will be aware that there was a long-acting monoclonal antibody preparation that was designed to prevent COVID, um, and that never got funding in England. Uh, so very, you could pay for it privately, but hardly anybody got it. And that was because it was felt to be ineffective against modern variants of COVID by the time we got ready to rolling it out. But it has been used uh, widely in the rest of the world. So, in principle, the Truva map could do the same thing. It could prevent people getting COVID. Um, I mean, the monoclonal antibodies, this is a basic science question, I don't know the answer, but the monoclonal antibodies weren't designed in the same way to be as persistent. Um, so, you would imagine that they would be broken down much more quickly because it was designed as a, as a treatment drug. But people talk about non specific effects of the stimulation of the monoclonal antibodies. Um, so, I think, you know. Wasn't my, you know, it was a very high level decision to, to to set that trial up. It's not something that I I have much say over, but it's <laughs> it, it, it's definitely something that we can look at complementary to that. So we intend to look at people who've had received treatment several times, for example, to look at safety, and um, and we can look at uh, we can look at recurrence rates among people who've got different treatments. So the positive spin on what you're saying is. I think that it's another situation where observational data can be a randomised trial. But in your data set of people who've already had it for an infection, have you the ability to look at reinfection? Yeah. Have you done that? Well, it's, it's become very problematic. So the problem is that people no longer have to report their, their test positivity. Um, so this, this whole work was done during the period of time where people either had to have to go into PCR 
or were um, confirmed that will close if they had a if they'd got a positive test. And what what helps this work is that if you were treated by a CMDU, clearly the physician who decided to give you the drug was confident that you definitely had COVID. So even if there's no data to say you, you've got a positive test tick, clearly that clinician felt you had COVID and needed treatment. Um, now in the routine data, we just don't have that. that we don't have that. We can look at hospitalisation um, and, and mortality. So but these are becoming very rare outcomes, fortunately. Hi, uh, Tim Lindsay from ETA College of David. Um, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I was interested, you can touch upon it, but I'm really interested in your view in using non randomized data, but trying to tackle unmeasured confounding of thinking of like instrumental variables. Um, David and I have a PhD student, and actually a previous uh, Morris Block lecture by Neil Davis from Bristol. Why am I going to look at this topic? And that shows to say essentially great promise in terms of trying to mimic T results, albeit they've got their own assumptions, you've got to find good instruments, et cetera, et cetera. I just wondered if you think in your own research or you what your viewpoint on them were. Um, it's a really good question. I've never done an instrumental variable analysis. Um, and I, I have, have you know, I've never read an instrumental variable paper where I thought, oh yeah, that really is an unbiased Thing. Um, and I read the paper and I think, well, clearly the decision to admit the patient to ITU was influenced by the severity of the illness rather than you know the number of beds available. So um, I don't see it as being one of the most useful efforts, but you're absolutely right, it should be up there as, as a methodological advance that can that can be used. Um I've got another question for you then, Charlotte. What you were talking about there required a lot of human intelligence about the disease, about treatment, about the health data systems. But we know that there's a big push towards kind of machine learning and artificial intelligence and you know, increase the value of our grant by two and a half fold if we add some of that in. Um, so what do you see as the opportunities and threats of AI to emphasis with observational data? Um, I'm, I'm going to sound like a complete Luddite, um, but I, um, I am very cautious about AI and this opportunity to run through huge analyses and find, uh, find correlations. And I, in my own work in AI, I just ended up thinking, well, this is meaningless. Um, and I really... Yeah, it, it, I, I know people are huge advocates, and I'm sure that there are very clever people who will work out a way to avoid us running into a lot of meaningless correlations, but um, at the moment, I can't see how that's going to be worth us with that. I'm a bit worried. Do we have anybody coming from an AI background in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to say thank you for the talk. It's really nice. And a thumbs up. Cheers. Um, well, in, I mean, this is a question that you're not expected to know the answer to, but it, it's a question that you brought up, and it is good to discuss. How do we know? How do we know that we've got our observational data analysis right? Well, I really need to go and have coffee and talk about that last. But I think, <laughs> um, I think there are there are metrics on which we can assess uh, how. Likely it is that we have been emulated an RCT in the absence of having that RCT. Um, and I think that that's, that's where the focus needs to be in really understanding where situations where you've not got it right, why you've not got it right. And then we can begin to, to be more robust about the, the chance of us having got it right. Um, I think at the moment we're, we're, we're not there yet. And I think that these kind of situations that I've outlined where you've got an RCT and you can extend the value of that RCT is much more useful for actual, actual making the decisions rather than the world in which we will be running these studies but with no external objective RCT data to, um, to I, I don't think we're there yet. Many people do, but 
Uh, <clears throat> this is a naive question. Um, it's not politically um, <clears throat> useful for you to do this, but you've been comparing RCT against these other methods. Um, would it be appropriate to start some work showing just how what RCTs are vulnerable to? Because if, as it is a editorial policy in the VMJ, for instance, they'll only publish RCJs, but how often does that lead to bad results because of well-known biases and people who run it? Um, like generalizing policy from the peculiar people who volunteer for this, who um, genders and socioeconomic. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's absolutely right. And clearly RCTs are limited uh, in, you know, they, again, they will disagree with me, but even in this example I gave you here, you've got a very selective clinical trial population, which is very different from that than the actual population in whom we're, we're trying to treat. So RCTs can be limited, and some are much more limited than others. But one of the things that's happened is we've got much better at assessing the quality of RCTs. And most doctors will now be able to read a paper and think good quality, bad quality, because they've learned that at medical school and they, you know, and, and same with he health academics. Um, that process has not yet followed through with observation data. So it's much harder for people to read an observation to a pharmacoepidemiological paper and understand it, let alone think good quality, bad quality. So, um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Obviously, there's a huge there's a huge politics around this, and the politics is that real-world evidence is overtaking RCTs and is bad, and I'm very much keen to step away from that. But you're undoubtedly right that RCTs have their limitations as well. Would it be worth quantifying those? Yeah, it would work. <laughs> that would, I mean, that's that's a, that's the major project. But I think it's something we could do here. Like we could align the two. The two. If we if we're looking at our real world evidence, uh, the strengths of that as the RCTs. It's also it's also important to outline the, the limitations of the RCTs. We'll bring Olivia in, and then we'll go online. Um, hi, Laurie. Thanks for a fantastic talk. I'm a huge supporter of maximising the value of real world data, and I, I'm a tiny bit disappointed when you said, "Oh, we're not, we're not there yet." And I was hoping to to hear that you're saying, "Well, you know, we are, we aren't there." Um, so I'm, one of my roles is to chair the NI Child Clinical Evaluations and Trial Committee, and I always thought, "Gosh, it'd be great to see an application using." using real world data to emulate trial. And um, so I guess my question is, you know, when will we know? Because you were doing a lot of this work comparing trials and observational data and, and, and occasionally we'll realize that it may be context specific in certain situations. So you know, what, what will we need to convince ourselves that, you know, that we're ready? Now they didn't ask me that in my interview. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a great question. It's, you know, what are the outcome measures that um, that will, will show us that we've achieved success? And I, I don't know what that what that looks like. I think lots of the, the, the RCT duplicate that I showed you, I think many people would have thought that, that they would perhaps have a higher um, replication rate of clinical trials and we could say, okay, look, if we use these methods, we can get there. But I, we're still at the stage where there is a lot of human intelligence um, needing to assess in depth the strengths and weaknesses of, of trials, uh, of observational data and, and trials to see what we might do. And I hope over the next few years that we will develop metrics of you know, that will very clearly show us how 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 likely we are that this is emulated in RCT. Um, and I think when we when we most of the trials that most of the observational studies that are being published are meeting those metrics, then we will be there. But we're not there yet. And it's like in it's like in RCTs, huge improvement in quality over the last twenty years. Most trials now published in good quality journals are very good, um, but it's taken a lot of a lot of work to get there. John Cleland, can I ask you to ask your question? Yeah, well, I enjoyed that. Uh, very instructive, and um, I'm, I've learned a lot. Uh, I, I was a co-author on the Stop ACE trial, so thank you for the the mention, and I accept uh, the limitations that you indicated. Um, you know, I don't think we should uh, forget the importance of real world evidence in terms of telling us the size and shape of a problem. You know, who has it? What the outcome is etc so for the planning of randomized controlled trials 
then perhaps we should be using the real world evidence uh, much more. Do you think that if you took three data sets, and I think uh, you've already done this in, say, UK, Sweden, and Denmark, uh, and you ran the same analysis and they came up with the same results, that that would uh, add to the validity? After all, for randomized controlled trials, we often, uh, in cardiovascular medicine, I guess, we're blessed. We often have three or four uh, randomized controlled trials before we're really convinced of the, the result. And finally, do you think uh, we should be doing the real world evidence study first where possible, uh, and then followed by the randomized controlled trial to show that uh, we can actually replicate it in clinical practice? Um, thanks. So to address the question about a country replication, I think um, conducting studies in different data sources from different countries can add a lot of robustness, and it's one of the, the, the ways of improving observation data that, I, that I've that's touched on. So I completely agree with you. But the trouble is that there are subtle biases in, um, in data from different healthcare settings that can lead to different results, even without even when we know that there is a true causal effect that we, we could estimate, but, but we're not able to do that. And so that Again, come back to this in-depth understanding of the potential types of bats, and specifically in relation to that study question. So I've done I've done country replications um, between between UK and, and, and Scandinavian data, and got similar but not quite the same, uh, and that's frustrating. And there are limitations. So uh, my students just replicated some data in Spain. Where they don't collect ethnicity data, and it's the same in um, in Scandinavia. By law, they can't collect ethnicity data. So, if you believe that factors around ethnicity are strongly correlated with the, with an outcome, that can lead to substantial confounding the country analysis. So, yeah, if you can replicate something between countries, I think it's a huge strengthening factor. But there may be very good reasons why you can't. It doesn't mean that you. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. Um, and in terms of the second part of the question, which was around what comes first, um, yeah, in a way, that's what we did here. So we completed the observational study of the stopping the asymmetries and ARBs before the stop ACE result was came out, and it was really exciting to see the results and, and see you know whether what we what we aligned on and, and what we hadn't. Um, I think. I mean, to, 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 to what you're, what, what, what's implicit in that is that people are going to adjust their analyses to get the right answer. And I hope that there's a lot of integrity and robustness in observational data analysis that would preclude that. I mean, you know, as I mentioned, pre-printing protocols and so on. And so, I, yeah, I think it, it doesn't really matter so long as it is being done uh, with integrity. I wonder Thank you. that's that, that's after two now, so um we should probably like, stick to time. I don't know if Lloyd's hanging around if you people have questions. Thank you very much again. Thank you.